it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Tony McGarren, and we speak about basketball and what he learned from being a basketball coach about facilitation. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, lean back and enjoy. Hi, Tony. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Miriam. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, and we already warmed up a little bit, and then I had to hit the record button as fast as possible because we already had so many interesting topics warming up, going into breakout rooms or not uh, when we are facilitating groups. Classic facilitators getting straight into it and and sharing strategies and tactics. Uh, it was brilliant. It's always good to chat to you, Miriam, to to learn different ways that you're approaching things. So that was useful. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And um, we'll dive deeper. And I always start with the same question, also to give the audience a little bit of context. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. A facilitator. Well, the, the, the short funny answer is probably since I started playing basketball. And, and stick with me for a minute, Miriam, because what I mean by that is there are various positions on the basketball court one of which is the point guard. And the point guard is responsible for, typically responsible for facilitating the offensive play, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you know, I, I see that as like facilitator and playmaker as somewhat interchangeable mm -hmm. and sort of similar roles. So I suppose when I started realizing that my role as a point guard in basketball was a facilitator on the court, but then outside of the basketball court, I think probably... Probably when I was finishing my education degree, I was going to be a teacher and I had a pretty real moment of, oh, I'm not really sure I'm a traditional sort of uh, mainstream education back in my hometown in Belfast, just teaching and training. I just didn't see that as who I was then. And I started to shift into, oh, wow, I can start to teach certainly and have aspects of that, but do it in a different way. And I think that's when I started calling myself a facilitator as I moved from, you know, mainstream education as a high school business studies teacher. Then I moved into the world of, of kind of community relations, facilitating conversations with different communities across the divide where I'm from in Belfast. So typically Catholics, Protestants, British, Irish, again, these, these, these terms are used interchangeably, but they mean completely different things. But just to, just to keep things relatively simple to answer the question more directly, that's when I started to see myself as a facilitator within this sort of peace building context. So the most difficult piece of facilitation that we can even imagine. And I think there's so many facilitators, especially in their early stages, who shy away from conflict or who don't really know how to do that because I think mediation is not really part of a facilitation training as we know it. And I had guests on the show, I think it was Steve and Sarah, and they mentioned that they heard from students of their training who said, oh, we never have conflict in our workshops until they did the inner work and learned to deal with conflict and then conflict appeared because they were ready and before kind of suppressing it. Mm. So that's a long story to, to ask the question, how do you now deal with conflict in your workshops? What have you learned back then from bringing these people with very opposite emotional um, mm. and social opinions and contexts together? Yeah, well, that was certainly a, uh you know, as they say, a baptism of fire in terms of learning and certainly uh, off into the deep end. And yet at the same time, I felt incredibly comfortable even back then. This is in my early 20s. So quite some time ago, Miriam, as you'll judge by my hairline. But yes, I, uh, <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, that was early stages, but I felt fairly comfortable in that space and dealing with conflict. One, because I knew I was walking into it. So unlike maybe those students, I was aware of what we were going into. So I was well briefed, so to speak, I suppose as us as facilitators, sometimes 
especially earlier in our in our career as facilitators, the client or the folks we're working with, I say, oh no, we're a great group. We're, we've got it all together. There's tremendous relationships. You're going to love them. They're great energy, and you get in, and all of a sudden, it's completely different. I think I think that's worse than what I experienced, which mm-hmm. was, hey, we're going in with a very specific purpose, and I suppose that's the first response to your question, which is when you're working with groups centering everything around a shared purpose is absolutely mm-hmm. critical. Yeah. I think with that, and then the second sort of second thing that I lean into is finding that common ground as well, which is somewhat overlapping with purpose, but finding common ground as to maybe shared experiences or things that they have in common. And and remember in this context of peace building, I was mostly working with young people. And so we use the sport of basketball to bring these kids together. So that was the shared purpose. You know, we're here to compete. We're here to play this sport. It's going to be great fun. And I suppose the common experience was many of these young people where I'm from in Northern Ireland, basketball not being a a popular sport, so to speak. It's much more of a minority sport. The shared experience was we're all new. We're all new mm-hmm. to this. So so they kind of it, it necessitated them to work together um, and sort of get through the conflict. Beautiful. So basically bringing the beginner's mindset into the space where nobody dominates the other physically. Absolutely. And what I then also wonder when you say creating the shared experience is maybe also the how do we experience it being in maybe a marginalized group or be having these opposing or being subject to several prejudice and Abs- absolutely so if you if you can picture this miriam you know we have these young people now we work with young kids from uh, as young as seven eight years old but we also work with young adults you know 16 17 18 mm. uh, and if you can imagine some of these sort of 16 17 year olds they've never actually spent time with the other community because they've grown up in the same you know rough geographic location but they've had their own cultural experiences in sport and music and arts and um, local communities and schooling for example all of these different experiences that have kept them apart and so some of the stuff that we did straight away was to try to identify things that even though we're on the other side quote unquote we actually enjoy a lot of the same things and mm. and kind of leaning into that and it, it it sort of started to remove the barriers of resistance and the prejudice right and we we focus more on kind of what we had in common as a group versus and um, what was different yeah and then i guess also the the movement the embodiment and that's something that i hear more and more in the facilitators world coming up and hopefully more clients embracing it the importance of the body playing in this work? What is your experience, especially as a basketball coach? Oh, massive. I mean, yeah. I Look, the, this organization I work with, they're called Peace Players International. They had a huge success just recently with being inducted into the Hall of Fame, which is a huge deal because of all the work they do, both in Northern Ireland, or sorry, not both, across the world, in Northern Ireland, um, Cyprus, South Africa, the Middle East. And when you describe kind of, that idea of the embodiment and using your body and physical activity and that sort of stuff, you know, it reminds me of just ultimately their mission, which is, or their sort of purpose. If children can play together, they can live together. So I think, Mm. I mean, could we not apply that to facilitating many of the workshops that you and I are involved in? I suspect so. Yes. Yeah. So the, the physic, and then the other thing, um, Mary, I'm sorry to cut you off. The other thing that, that sort of comes to mind is, yeah, this, this idea of, well, two things, contact in general, you know, and there's a lot of research into contact and, you know, how important that is for kind of uh, getting rid of tension. And I I'll, I'll always remember an experience with a coach from uh, the Middle East uh, who came to Belfast to teach us about some of the exercises they were doing with local people in the Middle East in terms of folks from sort of the Arab community and the Jewish community and how they were working together and myself and Again, I was very young at the time, but myself and one of my fellow coaches for this organization, we were kind of messing around and we started kind of competing with each other and really hitting each other a bit more than we probably should have. And and I'll never forget, he called us out and he stopped it right away and he said, we won't have that. And he really set up 
important boundaries because his point was every experience that these young people have with the other side is either going to reinforce prejudice, stereotype, sectarianism, whatever, uh, discrimination ultimately, or it's going to break it down. And so mm. when you're doing this, actually, so I, I'll never forget that moment. Mary, it was about 15, 20 years ago, but it really stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. The role or the responsibility of the facilitator or trainer being a role model mm. and always being observed. What we do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And mm? Oh, well, then the other quick story, Miriam, with, with the other quick story I was going to tell you was just last year, I was working with an insurance tech firm. That's right. And it was down in Dublin. So it wasn't too far away. And, and I thought, okay, you know what? This was all about kind of growth mindset and essentially supporting each other through change. And it was quite uncomfortable. And really, they needed to lean into their relationships and their leadership team mm -hmm. to kind of support one another in the different functions. And so, one thing that I had always wanted to do since I started started our business was to use basketball to help sort of highlight that. And um, we brought a we brought a bag of basketballs down that we actually borrowed from this charity that I used to work with doing this peace building work. And we went down and we had the managing director of this of this organization passing the basketball and I was teaching him how to pass. And then he had to teach everybody else. And then everyone would coach one another. And it was this amazing sort of outside this very traditional office building. And they're in many of them were in kind of formal, smart business attire. And yet they were like passing and shooting the basketball and learning to coach one another through it. And uh, that was really fun. So just taking some of those playful learning sort of never done before experiences of playing basketball and, uh, you know, giving them an opportunity to use that as a, as an experience together was really, really fun. And I think rewarding for them. Yeah. And beautiful. As you mentioned the quote before, and, um, those who can play together, can live together, can work together. <laughs> Absolutely. I never thought about it, but I, I, I wonder if I get away with that for our business for people playbook. I'll just call, I'll have to call up their director right now and say, hey, Brendan, is it okay if I just change it slightly to work for me? Because I totally subscribe to that. And you know, getting groups to play together and experiment and create absolutely is going to help them work better together. Never thought about it like that, Miriam. Thanks for that little nugget. Yeah, and maybe we can even play a little bit further with that because I assume, and I would be curious to hear from you, that there's so many, so many aspects of team games, basketball, that you can, or being a coach, a basketball coach, that you can actually apply to facilitation. And then being in this context of play, where you act from maybe more of an instinctive and intuitive place. And then you can, I assume just tell a lot about the organization of systems. How does the general manager actually coach and train the others? And how do they pass the ball? How much group work is there? I see you smiling and nodding. So I stop here. <laughs> I, I, I'm chuckling because, yeah, I think this, this intuitive piece, I think you use the word in, intuition. I would also add authentic. Mm. And I think that really sticks with me because then you see how people really are. And I think competition, learning new things, you know, being outside your comfort zone, doing something you've never done before. I keep, I keep saying that mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm a huge <laughs> fan of what you're doing in that space, but you I know, not, that, him. <laughs> not yet, um, but uh, no, that's, I think this type of experience is amazing because you get to see an authentic, you get to witness the authenticity from, for example, a group of people and, and how things really are. Yeah. Although I recently had a conversation about the topic of authenticity and what does it actually really mean? Oh, very good. What did you come up with as a definition? That for me, authenticity stops where we put on a role or an image or the wording that is actually not ours, as opposed to, and I think that's what we often imply when we speak about authenticity as someone who feels maybe insecure and therefore plays a role of being so insecure people very often come across as arrogant mm. just because they try to hide it and they hide it so badly <laughs> they go into the other extreme and i think it still can still be authentic it can still be authentic 
Is that what you're saying with yeah. the insecure? Yeah. Yeah. That the coping strategy is still part of yourself. Oh, that's know, interesting. You? Yeah. You're going another layer. Well, I'll give you a real life example. When you brought that up, I had this inclination to try and define authenticity mm-hmm. because I wanted to be seen to be expert. But I was able to zoom out and go, well, actually, I don't know. But I did look at the definition recently for a project because we're looking at something to do with the idea of an origin story, how we've come to be. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking on Google and just Googling it, authenticity. And I believe the word origin is somewhere in the definition, at least on Google. And Mm -hmm. I was going to Google it and I was going to try and sound really smart on this podcast. But then I realized actually that would be ironically, I think, inauthentic Mm -hmm. (laughs) and therefore so so yes i I think possibly you're right about that second level though because that's still part of who i am right um but yes this idea of putting a mask on i've done some work with founders before miriam and we've talked about this in the startup world because founders Mm -hmm. often are in a culture where they need to present their best selves they need to be seen to be you know uh, incredibly confident and skilled and experts and and leading their business successfully, regardless of the reality, uh, in order to attract both investors and I suspect customers at at an early stage in their business. But we're always trying to make sure we we kind of remove some of that because it's probably quite toxic and unhealthy as a culture overall. So, uh, so there, so again, we get to probably debate that, I, I, but I, I like that you've went a layer deeper to say, well, actually that's still part of you. So that could yeah. still be authentic. Yeah. And then maybe it's, I'm thinking out loud. It's it's a long tangent, (laughs) but then maybe it's, and it's still related to the facilitative work, I think, because the more we get the real humans behind all the masks um, into the workshop space or into the work, the better we can help them. So I wonder to what extent it's really the authenticity that we're looking for, maybe the vulnerability, Mm. Um, but then vulnerability is also one of those overused terms. So, for instance, you mentioning that you were looking up the definition in order to try to sound smart and then realizing that, oh, maybe that's not so authentic. That's so authentic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm becoming more and more aware of that. I certainly think that that takes practice, doesn't it? You know, and confidence in yourself and vulnerability probably actually is the truth to be to be at this stage in my career where I can say, you know what? Actually, Miriam, I don't know the definition of of authenticity and that's okay. Let's figure it out together. Let's explore what we understand of it, you know, and trust that that's going to be all right. Yeah. And why it matters for the group. I mean, ChatGPT has the answers to all of these questions, but what actually matters more than the definition is what is the group of the organization making out of it, right? Oh, I love that you brought up chat GPT. My goodness. You know, I, for the first time ever, I was on a call with a couple of our playmakers. We call our associates playmakers and we were, we were designing and they were like, oh, we should just use chat GPT. And, and we did. And I was like, oh, this will be terrible. Probably not going to get any good ideas. And I was kind of a cynic and quite reluctant to, to delve into it. But anyway, we threw it in and I think it might've been like emotional intelligence, build me a workshop on emotional intelligence. And I was like really skeptical. And it came back and I was like, actually, this is really quite interesting and quite and possibly quite useful. You know, that said, Miriam, I and I'd be curious on your views on this is I don't believe that, uh, certainly not yet anyway, that chat GPT and, and all of the incredible content available on the World Wide Web replaces the role of a facilitator. Mm. I think I think we're still got a job, at least for now. I agree. And I also think that ChatGPT is a fantastic co-facilitator or assistant. It's an mm-hmm. AI-powered assistant, right? Coming up with ideas that um, we might not. And I think especially if we have been... So I think ChatGPT is a fantastic tool for advanced and skilled facilitators because very often we might get, air quotes, lazy or we lose the inspiration or even the the drive to do something new. And then to ask ChatGPT to design as a workshop on emotional intelligence, and then not going to copy it 101, but to say, oh, this activity, I wouldn't have thought about it. Yeah, let's take it in and work with it. Awesome. Why not? Or for instance, writing workshop descriptions I don't do oh, this anymore. I asked her to, be, <laughs> to write my workshop descriptions. Much better skilled than I am. I think that's the the most uh, 
appealing use case for me too, Miriam. I yeah, I have I've I have very little interest in, in doing that. But no, you're right. And I, I couldn't agree more. It's a great assistant, a, a co-pilot, a good starting point um for exper- experience facilitators. I'm curious what made you use the word a useful tool for experienced facilitators, maybe versus newer facilitators kind of starting out? I think that newer facilitators quickly fall into the trap of, oh, that's amazing. I just do that. And I think in the facilitative work, as in any other profession, the devil lies in the details. And you were speaking about exiting or getting the group out of their comfort zone. So for me, this is related to psychological safety. And you need that in in the beginning. Can we trust that ChatGPT knows that we first have to start building the psychological safety in a workshop before doing anything else? I don't know. And if I'm a newbie facilitator, do I really see the nuances? Yeah, probably not. And and to your point, I think it could... Yeah, it could set a new facilitator up with a, f- a false sense of security themselves. We're like, wow, I've got this incredible plan to facilitate and I'll just go off and do that. Whereas, uh, yeah, there, there, there's certainly, certainly nuance. I mean, uh, again, the more and more I do this work in this space, the more I recognize that there's such a heavy weighting on our role as facilitators versus content. And I suppose that's where, you know, that's where I find, I think both myself and and where we're taking our business is that, you know, on one end of the spectrum, Miriam, you've got the kind of heavy content academic theory models research. And that's one thing, right? We can go online. I think chat GPT would be excellent for us to locate what we're looking for in, in that space. And then on the other side, and this is just where I find myself on the other side of the spectrum. I think there's kind of the play, the silliness, the kind of fun, which is great, but there's no purpose and it's Mm. not really thoughtful or meaningful. And look, and again, you know, there's probably room for that also, just as there is on the other end with the the theories, research models, and and so on the academic element. I try to put us in the middle, Mm. right? Where, where we're working with theories, models, research, and, taking it, making it palatable, but we're making it really fun. And we're kind of finding ourselves in the middle. And I think that is nuanced. I think that's hard to do because it requires a sense of both confidence and experience and understanding the, the room and designing thoughtfully for the group that you're working with and, and so on. I could probably rant about this for days. Yes, I, I totally agree. And I think that's the hard work that makes it feel easy. That's a facilitative part isn't the word, to make it fun and easily digestible. So to turn it around, and I, that's a question that I always ask, what makes a workshop fail in your experience? Oh, that's funny. It's kind of the, the, the simple and easy answer is doing too much of one of those things, you know, being at, being at one of the polar ends or the extremes, right, where you're, you're, you're so focused on content, which is why I, I also subscribe to your, your thinking around how facilitators, especially new facilitators and, and and sort of less experienced, should be careful about leaning into chat GPT because they can fall in love with content. Mm. And I think that's a scary path to go down. And I think that w- your workshop will fail because you're you're leading with content. And I've made that mistake. I mean, humbly and you know, I've made that mistake. I will make that mistake probably in the next couple of weeks because I go, oh, this is really interesting content. I'm gonna lead with that. And that's where I I think that's one way I think workshops can feel. Beautiful. Yeah, leading with content. And then it reminds me of what you said earlier, that um, you now grew your confidence and standing that you can also admit that you don't know something. And I think to be in this place then opens the doors to participants to actually contribute, share their knowledge, take space, which is, I think, ultimately our goal. Uh, yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And that's, again, probably ag- reinforcing this idea that if you lead with content and try and be the expert in everything, I think you're in trouble or you could be in trouble. And then I think, as as we mentioned on the other end, Miriam, is that a workshop can feel when it's not meaningful, not purposeful, not connected to a, a goal for that group. I think 
when you just do silly stuff. And I think that's the hard balance because I would actually want to increase more play and more enjoyment and more fun. But I'm cognizant that it has to feel authentic. <laughs> it comes mm. back. Here comes that word again. It can't feel gimmicky or just novel or just the phrase we would use in Ireland is for the crack. <laughs> it, has, it has to actually mean something to the group and it has to suit them. And And as you mentioned earlier, if you lead with just that sort of fun silliness element without sort of aligning on a purpose or creating psychological safety for these things to happen, I think that's another way that uh, workshops can feel. Yeah. Which now brings me back to you being the basketball coach. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't mind. And your learnings from that, because I've never thought about it in that way, but using a team sport as an entry point to play in a air quotes serious context may be the most authentic or honest way because there are rules. There is no silliness to basketball. It's a game with rules that you have to follow. And there are certain strategies and techniques to do it well and to win. Yeah. What did you learn from from your role as a basketball coach to <laughs> I'm laughing because it's like where do I start almost almost everything uh mm -hmm. Miriam almost everything I, I mean I certainly you know I spent and this is for context not for hashtag humble brag you know but I spent about seven years working in Google which is a fairly reputable company but I can hand and heart say I learned what tons more from being involved in basketball when it comes to designing and facilitating workshops from mm. that experience. And, and so I, I'm chuckling because I, I, you know, I, I could probably talk forever about this, but I'll maybe give a couple of the top points. I will also clarify, which is probably the starting point. It's interesting that your perception, are you a basketball fan player? Um, no, no, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a never, uh, <laughs> never done before, but <laughs> yes, look, basketball is great, but it's interesting that your perception is, look, there are rules, but it's about winning. What if I said to you, it was, for example, my team over the last four years is under 12 girls basketball is winning the goal. Mm. Possibly, yes. possibly yeah. it depends on the coach, right? For me and the club ethos as well. What's the culture of the organization? What are we mm -hmm. trying to do here? And, uh, you know, let me, let me reassure you, winning was never the goal. It was about enjoyment of the game. It was about development. It was about getting better, right? It was about progress over perfection, right? With these, mm -hmm. these young, young girls who are a phenomenal group uh, of, of, of young girls who want to get better at basketball. Of course they want to win and, and some of them care more about it than others. And it's my job to take them um, through that process. So it is interesting just as you say that, right? Because I also knew, I was talking to a friend who plays in in the top division here in Ireland and he was talking about their coach doing some silly basketball games during practice mm. and, and how all the players, these are adult men, were like, this is so brutal. We're not interested in this silly game, silly basketball game. So again, it's interesting about how just like in a workshop or a session, we have to be thoughtful about both the group, but also their goal, their purpose, what they want from it, and then design accordingly. So there's an example of, you know, this top basketball team in the country, one of the top teams doing silly stuff where the people, where the players are like, this is a waste of our time and they're not bought in and it's demotivating and it's disengaging. So it's not really interesting just before we even get into lessons learned, you know, I've been able to navigate coaching at different levels throughout my basketball coaching career and, and approach them with first trying to empathize and understand the group and what their goal is and what mm -hmm. role I'll play in that. Thank you so much for clarifying Yeah, th these assumptions that I brought in, totally <laughs> unconscious and so strong, actually, <laughs> so biased. And yeah, if we're, if we're coming to a group, are we sure that they all have the same goal this they understand the same purpose so a basketball team yeah maybe some want to win and others just want to improve and others just to want to make friends maybe and for still others it's uh, the the babysitter of the parents and they actually don't want to play basketball exactly <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Now we're getting, I mean, again, maybe for another time, I'll tell you more about the unique and differentiated goals from kids as age, uh, you know, kids and parents in our basketball club. But no, again, uh, the sort of top thing that sticks out in terms of the crossover that I see between basketball coaching and facilitating is the core understanding that in a specific time frame, we're never going to be able to address everything and achieve everything we want to. I, I really believe that is one of the greatest challenges mm. when you are leading and facilitating workshops. I think you can go in and say, oh, we're going to we're gonna do this and that. And oh, the team wants to do that. I'm going to help them get there. Here's me and my horse just riding in and I'm going to save the day as the facilitator. When in reality, actually, a, a really effective facilitator knows what is feasible or has a more realistic kind of look at themselves and look at the team and, and what's what's possible, right? Now, mm. that's not, I, I don't mean that to sound doom and gloom, but the reality of it. And I think in basketball, what's beautiful about uh, this game is that there's so much in it. There's offense, defense, shooting, passing, rebounding, dribbling. You know, you can do 2v2, you can do 5v5, you can do transition offense, transition defense. There's never a shortage of things that you can work on. And so, as a coach, just as you would be as a facilitator, you got to get really clear on what's going to have the greatest impact. Mm. And right. And and in the basketball space, it's about the greatest impact that's going to typically help us perform better. Or if it's younger players, it's about where's the biggest gap that we need to address. Yes. And what you just explained make me think of my own practice. I'm not a basketball player, but I'm a runner. And I used to kickbox, so more on the solo, solo sports side. <laughs> But what I realize is there are certain things that I love to train. And then I would always focus on that. And I love long runs. But then the sprints, ah, maybe next week. <laughs> so and the, the parallel that I see with the work that you're doing is, and with workshops with clients, is Does the group or the client, the sponsor of a workshop, know what we need to train on? And isn't it so easy to focus on that what comes easy and what we actually need the least? And how do you then convince them that what they actually need is maybe something different? That is so cool of you to call that out, Miriam. You've opened my eyes to another sort of connection to, to address that question head on. Any work I do outside of the basketball court, so so in our business and people playbook, and when I'm facilitating, constantly trying to gather data, insights, information to be able to address that question, right? Is is what you've said you want to work on? Is that the actual area that needs the most attention, right? In basketball, it's a similar process. It's let's look statistically at where we're falling short. So if we have a basketball game, let's say I had a game last week with my team. Let's take the men's team for an example, because it's adult and therefore they're more likely to be capturing statistics. So let's say in, in last week's game, we win by four points. And that's great because you've won, but we're assessing and analyzing performance because we're not going to go back to practice this week. And so in last week's game, we look at the statistics and we can tell that We were out-rebounded, meaning the other team gathered more rebounds than us. And even though we won, which is fantastic, we still lost the rebounding battle. So we can look at that data and say, okay, well, we need to get better at that because yes, we won on this occasion, but against a different team or the same team in the future, we're going to struggle. So let's focus on that. So again, data statistics is really helpful in understanding mm -hmm. where to spend your time and energy. Because as you say, some players might say, oh, I, I just want to shoot the ball or I just want to do this or do that. But if we're all aligned on the on the kind of shared goal, just like in a workshop, we can all work together on it. And I love your example and how you corrected your example last second um, to look at a team that won the last game. Because I was just facilitating a lessons learned workshop this morning for a team that, yes, they reached the milestone. Yes, their client wants to continue. So yes, it's a win. And there were some major difficulties and stuff that didn't go right. So it's it can be so easy for groups to only focus on what went well and then, okay, so we achieved the goal. Let's celebrate that. 
and go on holiday. Yeah, that's so we enforce. I lo- <laughs> yeah, I love that. And and typically, I, I wonder if this is your experience. So typically, but not always, we're brought in as facilitators when things are not necessarily going to plan. The, the team or the organization or the group of people, they're not winning. And then as a facilitator, you can you can come in and start to identify. And I actually find that somewhat easy or easier to kind of identify. You know, everyone kind of knows we're looking around, they're looking around at each other going, yeah, we're not where we need to be and we need support, we need help. And that's why they're they're reaching out to folks like us, Miriam. The teams and organizations that I've worked with that are super high performing that invite me in to work with them, that's really fun. That's hard. You know, they're already great. And what they're trying to do is move from great to excellent. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of percentage points in terms of we want to be a little bit sharper. We want to be a little bit more aligned. We want to be a little bit more clear about our purpose. It doesn't really matter. Those are the, the, I find that really challenging, but really Mm -hmm. exciting and rewarding as a facilitator. Yes. And I can imagine that these are the teams and the individuals that, yeah, they're used to winning. They are open to the hard work. And still, I think the hard work is always difficult. So finding the spot where you can actually put your finger in. Yeah. And how do you get these groups out of their comfort zone into the growth zone where they actually already have this confidence of, oh, yeah, we got it sorted? That's a really good question. Because we're currently navigating between the sports world and the facilitated sort of workshop world, I'm I'm sort of thinking about both. I guess I'll answer the sports one quickly because it is the first one that came to mind, which is it's very easy to help a team understand that, yes, you've won today, but you might not win tomorrow. It's just the nature of sport, right? And if you want to be excellent, and you want to continue to have success, you know, that there's no off days really in sport, you know, you've got to be thinking. So I know that, uh, is it loss aversion, right? You know, people are motivated by the the potential for loss. I think in sport, it's, it's very easy to work with mm-hmm. the team if they're driven by success and high performance, which in this example, that is the case. So I think let's put the sports people aside. I think where I've seen organizations effectively do that in kind of the workplace is not dissimilar in the sense that acknowledging things are going really well right now, but, you know, in order to continue to excel and continue to perform. And, you know, I have seen organizations call out competitors and say, you know, these these folks are doing amazing stuff over here. Look where they're at. You know, let's not get complacent. Let's continue to think about other ways we can improve. So I've seen it in both realms and it's, it's difficult and there's there's more nuance to it, of course, Miriam, because that doesn't mean you burn people out and it doesn't mean you're just constantly on them. There, there's so much nuance to it, but those are the, kind of the things that come to mind. Yeah. As you mentioned, um, burning out, I was thinking also of the topic, and this was the topic of the workshop this morning that I had was, yes, we we're successful, but at what cost? Ah, wow. And how can we reduce the cost? In the future, because, um, yeah, we can't perform by burning out all of our people and working overtime and just swallowing all the conflict and not setting boundaries. But then um, is this really the cost that we're willing to pay in order to win? It's heavy stuff. That's a, that's a heck of a Monday morning. Miriam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for everybody, for everybody. I love that. So. Yeah, I I can only imagine the conversations and I am curious to hear. I suppose my initial reaction to this, which is something that I'm constantly, constantly promoting as a core message of of this work that we're doing is sustainability, Mm. right? So I think you can win in the short term. And sometimes, Miriam, that's the reality of of being in the workplace. There, There have been times in my life where we've had some really heavy uh, workloads or a heavy workload with a project that requires our, our attention and our energy for a somewhat sustained period of time, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe a quarter. And that's fine. That's the way it goes. And there's something fun about that, by the way. There's something exhilarating 
as a human to be striving for something that's really quite hard, but it's meaningful. And if we're all rallied behind it, Jesus, this is some of the best experience I've ever had in my in my personal and professional life has been working on things that are hard and meaningful that take time and energy. So let's be careful. Like, I always want to be sure that we cover that because that's important and it's required. And at the same time, you've got to, you got to pay the piper and you got to pay the deficit and you will pay the deficit at some point, the energy deficit. And as a business leader, I might say to you, great, where do you want to pay the price? Mm. You know, where do you want to pay the price? You want to pay it through attrition. So people are going to decide, I have had enough of working for you. This is too much for too long. I'm out of here. Do you want to pay the price by giving people two weeks off at the end of the sprint? Because you say, Mm -hmm. well, like I'm willing to pay that price. And, you know, and it depends, right? And, And some organizations I've seen, sadly, are happy to burn through people and burn them out and just rehire and just start the Mm -hmm. cycle again because they think that they're still, they either think that they're still up, maybe they know they're still up, they're still in terms of their profit margin and their profitability is still going to be high or they just don't care or they're just not aware. I'm I'm never sure. And I'm I'm sure it's a a myriad of of all those reasons. It's just not something I would be prepared to pay as a a business leader. I love the the open question. How are you willing to pay the price? Because they might also... And this is, I'd assume, not sustainable. Pay the price by um, paying bony. Okay, so you burn through your people and they get bonuses. I think that's how the consulting industry (laughs) has survived for a very long time. And I think this is where I see the major difference maybe to sports. That in sports, as a sports coach, you really want to be sure to maintain the balance or you know exactly when it's time to rest because you're aware that the body and the health of your players is the core asset. Whereas the team, well, they do depend on every single player as well. So there are codependencies, but in the, um, in the business world, so to debrief such a project and then where to set the boundaries and how to help to really honor physical and mental health. Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, let's take the sports analogy. And again, I'll address some, some important sort of examples of this. So there's been a lot more what they call load management in recent years within my sport of basketball. So in the NBA, so coaches are deciding, let's say Miriam, you're one of our best players and we have a long season. You have 82 games before we get to the playoffs. So early in the season or at the midpoint, I'm going to rest you intentionally. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyway, there's a whole debate about whether that's fair because fans pay ticket prices to see Miriam play and Miriam doesn't play. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. But I love that coaches are doing that in terms of looking after their players and recovery, mm. as, as you rightly pointed out. And again, I just want to call out the the question that I think I asked, but I'm not sure. We'll have to listen back. Yes. What like I, the cost I'm talking about is energy and bonuses. No amount of money is going to give you more energy. I'm sorry. Mm. It's not. It absolutely is not. We are human. We are limited in that resource. Thank and so, yes. so having that money is great. And I see it. I have friends who've worked in, in finance and, you know, they, they're burnt out and they're like totally running away now and uh, leaning into escapism. And even though they're getting paid handsomely, it's just not enough because their body's telling them no. So I think it is, it's a, su- it's a super interesting conversation around performance and sustaining performance and the price you're willing to pay. And 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 sometimes business leaders, and they're happy to pay the price of having their team make mistakes through fatigue. But, you know, we don't have to look much further than our NHS in this part of the world. Do I want an overworked doctor or nurse looking after my elderly family member or me if I'm injured and, and need some serious attention? No, I do not. That's not a price I'm will. You know, I would be willing to pay. And there's an example again of wouldn't. Ma- it's not about necessarily getting paid more. We have to make sure we're sustaining performance. Yeah. And how do you lead if you do? Because I would assume that these are the conversations that need to happen when you facilitate these high-performing teams. So yes, high performance, but what is the price that we individually are willing to pay, and how to set boundaries? Yeah, how to set boundaries is crucial. So 
I think there's the micro element of rest and recovery, and then there's the macro. So the micro meaning like taking the right break, staying hydrated, clocking off, not working all night. And I think the pandemic, you know, really was was challenging for people because the boundaries were gone. To your point, I think that's changed in these facilitated conversations. Anything that I'm doing, any type of work, I'm always talking about sustainability because it it just it. It filters through everything. It, if it's a change leadership project, change management project, a new way of working, if it's manager development work that we do a lot of, we're helping managers improve how they lead people. We're, you know, this comes up all the time, and so you know, we're constantly addressing it head on. Both how can this individual be responsible for setting their own boundaries, and then how can the organization set up the systems and processes and perhaps rituals that ensure that their people are able to sustain a uh, sort of a high level of performance over a period of time. Yeah. And what I hear is the important distinction between the individual level and the organizational level. And these yeah. are different lenses on looking on sustainability and what it means. Yeah. Have you ever worked with someone, Miriam, whereby they've left one culture and joined another? They're usually bringing with them their their thinking, their the way they've behaved and acted in that culture. I see it all the time, right? And they bring it into a place. I actually saw it a lot in my former employer, whereby there was a lot of people being hired from the likes of, you know, Amazon or Microsoft, and they were being hired into Google. And you saw that culture mm. being taken with these individuals over. So again, just understanding how you show up, right? Oftentimes when I'm working with certain individuals, I'll hear them They'll set themselves a very high bar and they're prepared to burn themselves out because, and I, I would suggest that's in, institutionalized thinking from their previous organization and they carry it with them, but they might be in a culture that says, hey, it's okay to say no. Actually, in fact, and he won't mind me sharing, we've just made our third hire for our business and Adam is his name. He's our, he's our kind of visual guru. He's a brilliant graphic designer, animator. He does anything with the sort of the visual world. And he himself has had conversations with me about, for example, checking in with me at lunch and saying, oh, I'm actually, I'm just popping out. And I'm like, hey, take as long as you want. I don't, I'm not managing your lunch break. You know, like you have your goals, you know what you need to get to. I don't need to know that level of detail. And that I think is a hangover that he's bringing from a previous workplace in terms yes. of having to be in certain places at certain times. Oh yeah, and it's so it's interesting because it how it can affect or it will surely affect the team. And then it's a yeah, it's a, a game of strengths to see which culture will survive and whether the team's culture is actually strong enough. Because I think if it's one team member who joins, then it might be one thing. If suddenly it's a team leader who joins, and I have observed that working in the public sector in my previous life, where for reasons of higher professionalism, air quotes, <laughs> uh, efficiency, they hired middle managers coming from um, the corporate world. And this really caused big conflict. So how do you, maybe you have a practical tip on this clash of cultures? Yeah, good, good question. I, I, I want to echo and this is probably perhaps part of the tip, to be honest, which is echo the disproportionate impact that a leader will have on a team and a culture. That's I think that for me anyway, in my experience, is is kind of a is almost factual, right? That they come in and the individuals that report into that leader will be looking to follow their lead essentially and and will be impacted by any change in culture that will filtrate throughout. And so with that, you know, oftentimes I think we as facilitators, and this is, the, this is kind of the, the, the tip really around it is that we've got to get really close to leadership when we're designing and building workshops. We have to be so close to them because we get to, if we're an external facilitator, we get to play that role of asking good questions to make sure that leader is aware of how they're you know, proposed changes, the direction, the vision they have, how it's going to impact the wider team. And as an external facilitator, I'm re removed enough and I, you know, 
although they may be my client, I still have a level of disconnection where I can, uh, I have more confidence ultimately to challenge and challenge gently and lightly and, and respectfully, most important. But I think that's the, that's the tip is that as a facilitator, let's get close to our leaders that we're working with so that we really understand their vision and that we're asking them these open questions that help them think through their vision before we even get into a room with anyone else. It's mm. too, if we're in the room, Miriam, and it comes up, it's too late because it's very difficult then. I think, although it can be done, if you can do it skillfully to challenge a leader in front of a group, I think you want to avoid that as, as far as possible. And I think that requires you getting closer uh, earlier yeah. on. Yeah, that's such a good point because you yeah, challenging the leader, especially on things that might be real blind spots. Because I think culture is something that is so ingrained that we very often don't even realize how much we're affected by it. So I think someone informing or asking you whether they can take a longer lunch break or someone putting you in copy to each email that they are sending someone who is so there are so many micro examples that give us an idea of culture where this person is coming from and i think it's so normal that they might not even be aware of i agree i agree entirely and and what a, what a great resource you can be as an external facilitator to ask a question that that helps them unlock that insight to go gosh i didn't even know i was doing that that's something we used to do in my old company or that's something that i have been doing unintentionally and i think that's one of those moments as a facilitator when you help a leader see something for the first time that's going to help change their culture for their team for the better as a facilitator it's like oh this is the best job in the world yeah yeah and maybe even I think these are the small things that make a big difference, and I'm thinking out loud, but that we might often forget in these team building workshops that, yeah, it's nice to discuss about our personality types and um, and maybe play some, some games <laughs> or uh, to discuss our team values, but what are actually the small things and what do they mean to us? Because I think someone who puts everyone in copy, because this has always been the company's culture or expectation, might not even realize that for someone else, it's maybe a lack of trust or feeling, yeah. Yeah, that's so. I'm so glad you called that out because that is why I'm hesitant to ever say that what we do is team building and I call it team development because mm -hmm. I feel like it's much more pointed. And as I mentioned, it's in that middle spot of, yes, we're going to have fun. It's going to be a great experience, but it's going to be meaningful and purposeful. And that is a great example. Even that little micro example of bringing to light little cultural norms and calling them out in a group, that's, that's team development. That's getting to the heart of, do we trust each other? Can we depend on one another? Because that's really critical to how we perform as a team. Mm. And if people are saying, yeah, yeah, no, we do, we do. Well, then you might say, well, what's the reason and the purpose behind CC and every single person in the email? That's really good work then. Now we're really developing as a team. Yeah. I love the distinction between team building and team development. I don't know if it does anything, Miriam. It's more for my own sanity. I, you know, when people ask me, oh, Tony does team building and people playbook or they do team build. We don't, we do team development because we, we really want to develop your team to perform better and, 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 and all the beauty that comes with that in terms of enjoying the work more and, and working on the right things together. So Miriam, I'm cutting myself off because you asked me a question like 30 minutes ago. And I wanted to share more basketball lessons and facilitation. Could do you mind if I get a couple out before I forget? Please do. Classic Thank facilitator you. coach, because I was like, no, I want to share it. I want to answer that. I want to share that. Well, one of the one of the funny things is as I, as I was reflecting on our conversation that we were going to have today was around these yeah lessons from the basketball coaching world and how it applies to my facilitation. One of the things that I'm always teaching other facilitators about is the importance of organizing activities in the right way mm. and so that they flow because it almost ties into that question earlier. You asked, well, what, you know, what can cause a workshop to fail when I am in a workshop where a facilitator poorly executes on activities and debriefs and movements between this to that, to this, and it feels clunky. And this group over here is doing something that this other group didn't understand what's going on. And this group's actually a way to get a cup of coffee and, oh, and you know, this group's talking about the weekend plan. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this 
we, we've let this group down as a facilitator mm. because we haven't set them up for success. The basketball equivalent is, and I learned this from mostly working with young people, but adults are just as, um, just as difficult at times. <laughs> if I'm preparing for an activity and I give the instructions, or sorry, I send them off into the corners of the room, for example. This is such a silly example that I'm sure you can relate to, but if I send the group off to different parts of the room or the basketball court, and then I start to articulate the instructions, I've lost them because they're already in small groups and it's it's dreadful. And the basketball court, yeah, yeah. It's not only chat, 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 it's dribble, 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 and I can't hear anything because there's now 20 basketballs dribbling on the court. Mm. And that's on me, not on them, because in this instance, they're probably 10-year-old girls from my team. And uh, of course, they're going to go and get distracted. And again, I've seen that all the time with um, with adults. So when I'm planning my sessions, Miriam, I am incredibly methodical about before I put them into breakouts, before I share it, you know, before I ask them to do anything, before I give them a resource. Maybe I've got a playbook that I want to give them and I want them to go to page seven and start completing this, this diagram and, and start thinking through it. But if I do that, if I give them the playbook before I've given them, you know, clear instructions that are like no more than three points, we're in big trouble. So that's just one of those little things that I've experienced from basketball. Does that resonate with you? Oh, totally. Yes. Thank you. And that's such a usual mistake because maybe we're overly excited or we, I think very often are not aware of the impact of our words. Mm. And then we send them off and then, yeah. They do yeah. Yeah, they do whatever, and I and and it happens to me still as a facilitator. I I mistakenly will send a group, and I go, oh, wait, wait, come back. And I still think as a facilitator, like we talked about, you've got to be confident enough to own your lack of clarity. You have to go. I I don't. I cl- I thought I was clear, but there's 50 people here that have no clue what they're supposed to be doing. So I've I've got this wrong, and I need to rectify. And I think it's better to you know, find a way to solve that. And again, these are the type of real life experiences I had first and foremost, when I was very young coaching basketball, I experienced that on the basketball court. And I could recognize that as I transitioned to become a facilitator. Which then also reminds me of something that we discussed before we hit the record button of the breakout room. So we discussed whether or not we would visit a breakout room during our workshops. And we both agreed that we don't. Thank goodness. But then how do we control whether the group is doing the exercise that we asked them to do? Yes. I hear your sigh. I know. I, uh, yeah, I'm so glad. And and that's, that's what I, I would have expected you to say that, by the way, knowing you from your, you know, from your work and, and how I've been kind of watching the stuff that you do, Miriam, I suspected we would fall on the same uh, path together on that or, or, or thinking. So Absolutely. When you put them in a breakout room, just leave them be, especially on, especially online. I think in the physical space, I'm happy enough to walk around and sort of, you know, pick up little things as I walk. But by and large, I just want to give a really meaningful, useful task and then get the heck out of the way. Just get out of the way. And I think online, the thought of jumping into a breakout room and it, it notifying them and sitting there on screen and having equal space as the participants mm. feels incredibly intrusive. Yeah, true. And and you know what's funny, Miriam? I'm going to make another connection to, to what you just said in, in terms of the basketball world. It's kind of, I think the use of breakouts and small groups is absolutely critical. Again, something I learned from basketball. So here in in Belfast, you know, I might have a group of 25 girls on my under 12 girls team, right? 25 girls. And there'll be myself and an assistant coach, right? Think of it as a facilitator and co-facilitator. Mm. I'm so aware that when we're doing large group stuff, as in I'm talking at 25 people, that's incredibly draining for these 25 young girls who want to play basketball, right? They're not getting a chance to develop. So for example, I'm not going to spend, you know, 20 minutes teaching them how to shoot a basketball and and teach them the the, the theory ultimately or the how to behind shooting a basketball. I'm going to give them an opportunity quickly to, you know, understand some of the key ways to learn how to shoot and then get them into breakouts and have them work with each other. And even I've, you know, and I've taught 10 year old girls how to understand how to shoot the ball so that they can actually look at the other person who's also 10 years old and coach them. Mm. And so what a great way to 
divide and conquer, give them room and space to fail and to get lots of reps up and lots of practice and lots of experience, really. And agency and yes. peer accountability and growing respect, all of that. Absolutely. Which is what we try and do right in, in, in the facilitator world. And actually, that's a good example of the other thing that I do uh, that I've learned from from both teaching, but also from coaching basketball that I apply to facilitation. So have you heard of the concept of like whole part whole teaching? No. So essentially, let's take, for example, okay, here's a good example. So let's say I'm facilitating a workshop on trust. Right. So trust is the theme and we're trying to improve trust in the, in the team. We're trying to help them improve their relationships. Right. Trust is a pretty heavy, heavy topic and concept. Right. There's a lot in that. And so we really, you know, having an initial exercise or activity, I think is really fun to think about trust holistically and from a, mm -hmm. from a higher level. I love starting off with like, you know, who do you trust the most in your life or, Imagine you were going to decide on where to buy your next car or where you were going to buy your next holiday. You know, where would you go and why would you trust them with this, this process, right? That's a really fun mm -hmm. entry point into the concept of trust. That is what I would consider kind of the whole of trust, right? Kind of how trust plays, plays a role in our lives. And you could put this in the workplace if you liked, but sometimes I like a different thing just to get the brain moving. The part element, which is the second element, really digs into breaking down trust into smaller bite-sized knowledge insider skills, mm. right? So I might say, okay, in that large kind of first ex exercise, we might identify that actually, and this is one of my favorite parts of trust, is this concept of self-orientation. So am I orienting myself around my own needs or your needs? Mm. And if it's all about me, Miriam, the chances are, that's going to probably hinder your ability to trust me because you're going to see through the BS and say, this is all about Tony. This podcast mm -hmm. is all about Tony. He just cares about blah, blah, blah. Right? And all of a sudden, I'm going, to, I'm going to damage the trust that we have. But if I take self-orientation as a small part of trust and say, well, look, how do you demonstrate low self-orientation, meaning you're caring more about the other person's needs and desires? That's the part of the teaching. So we go from the large kind of, this is trust. How would you go about thinking about trusting the person next to you, your neighbor? And then we look at a very specific part of trust and then we'll come back and we'll apply mm -hmm. that. And again, in the basketball context, you know, I might teach my girls to shoot the basketball or sorry, I might put them in a basketball game right away, get them playing. And then I'll bring them back and I'll say, okay, it's clear we need to work on shooting. So let's look at shooting. Okay. Let's teach this. And then go practice that, and then we'll come back and we'll play another game. And the shooting hopefully will have improved. Again, mm -hmm. you can apply that to the trust model there. Yeah. And then you have the very regular feedback loop. Everyone knows what they're talking about, and it becomes very applicable. Sounds like a experiential learning circle. Cycle. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. I have um, two more questions, hopefully, before we close. One is about the oranges of um, People Playbook? Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, geez, good question. Uh, we, we talked about people and about play. Oh, yeah, there so you go. I, sh <laughs> Shockingly, you've made the connection already. Well, <laughs> well, funny uh, story, Miriam. My business, when I started it, it was originally called Fix It Fridays. And I'm so glad I changed cars. the day. Fix It Fridays. Yeah, just not on Mondays. But it was originally called Fix It Fridays. I ended up with People Playbook, which I'm delighted with because I've been given feedback that it's sticky and people remember it. People first always. That's the most important bit. That's why people is there. People first always. And then the second idea around a playbook is that from the sporting world, we talked about basketball most of this podcast, which has been fun. And uh, thank you for uh, um, being so generous and allowing, allowing me to share my crossover thinking in that space. The idea of a playbook is that, is, is that it's a resource that is ever growing. It's dynamic. It's evolving. You're changing it. You have to make it work for a specific team. You couldn't, Miriam, coach basketball in the Netherlands and come to Ireland and take a completely different team and say, oh, I've got a playbook. This is going to work for you. And I think the same when it comes to facilitating groups and working mm. with organizations. So when we talk about playbook, it's not that we know everything about every aspect of 
org design, development, culture, leadership, learning, team development. It's that we want to build a playbook with you and for you that works for you mm-hmm. and that it's going to be unique and and bespoke to your needs, right? So that's the, the idea of the playbook. It's about being really useful and actionable because you asked about the origin. I've had so many experiences in the past where much of the sort of leadership learning and development experiences I had had, both as an employee and then and then later on working with others, I just find it to be not very practical and useful and applicable. I didn't find it to, you know, I find it to be either one end of those, the, the spectrum I mentioned, mm-hmm. either too gimmicky, team building, not very effective at, at sort of achieving the goal of improving how a team works. And then you know, in the leadership development space specifically, I find it very research-based, very theoretical and abstract, and therefore very difficult for leaders to actually put into practice. So again, all of the different experiences that I've accumulated in this space, yeah, led to led to People Playbook. And we do lots of things and and I the broad sort of three pillars of learning, leadership, team development. And uh yeah, it's been fun. It's been about four years, Miriam, and I just I'm just so grateful to do the work and I I know you are cuz your energy talking about this space is is amazing and it, you know lights you up and what a great job we have to be able to serve organizations and people and help them hopefully uh, not only just perform better either as leaders or as teams but also enjoy work a bit more. Yes. And what a great opportunity to also bring all of our past experiences into the world and that's why I was delighted to hear more about the basketball and what you learned as a coach and bring into the facilitation world, because I think that's actually where we learn and find inspiration from each other to look at our work from a new perspective and through new lenses. And I think that's also what sets us individual facilitators or facilitation agencies or companies apart is um What perspective, what lens do we bring to the game? Oh, you're, you're, you're so right. And that's why, as you know, and I want, I'm, I'm not sure if this was going to be your last question, because I know when we spoke about it, you were pretty excited about hearing more. That's why I also love to make sure that the playmakers, the people in my team that I get to work with are coming from a very different space. They're coming with different ideas because it would be boring if we were just a team of basketball or sports people. That just happens to be my experience. But I love working with, you know, comedians and musicians. <laughs> As you know, we 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 trialed out a songwriting workshop over the last couple of months and it's been phenomenal. So again, to your point, that's such a great opportunity for us to learn from one another. Yeah. And since you mentioned it, maybe you can share with the audience about this songwriting workshop. Um, ah, it's been great. So when I started this business, it was the literally the the start of the pandemic. It was March 2020. And I was doing a lot of stuff online. I know I mean, it was I know it was uh it was tough timing, but actually in another way, it ended up there was an, an incredible amount of silver linings in that I ended up having this global marketplace. I had a very captive audience online. We were doing, I was doing, I say we, it was just me at the time in my bedroom <laughs> starting this business. And one of the things that that I was able to do was work with a couple of local musicians who would log on and maybe kick workshops off with a song. And I find that it was so jarring for participants from all over the world, didn't matter the culture, but it put them in such a positive, you know, mindset that they were like, oh, they were open. It shocked them. They were, you know, sitting at home, dealing with the pandemic, probably many other, all the challenges associated. And then they would hear music and go, oh my goodness. And so that really set me up to do my job well. Right. So that was beautiful. And and I work with two incredible musicians, um, Lucy and Rebecca, and they've been with me for, you know, four years now almost. And they're both amazing. And one of the, one of the dreams that I had was to leverage their skill set, passion, talent, and take that into this world of facilitation. And I just needed an excuse. I needed the right client who would be open to it, who would understand that it's not gimmicky, it's not novel, it's not silly. It's actually incredibly useful for an or- for a team and an organization to participate. So we did it twice. We did it with a, an energy company here in Ireland and uh, with a graduate group who were incredibly shy and nervous and anxious about you know both writing music and writing a song but then 
also recording. So we actually get the participants to record their voices, sing into a microphone, which is massively momentous for them. And and so they did it and we produced a music video. It was phenomenal. And then we brought it a second time to a team from Google and it was they were from across Europe, Middle East, Africa, and they were more senior. They were equally as anxious about writing a song and recording it. And they also came out of it going, wow, that was amazing. So in both groups, although very different starting points, different cultures, different levels of experience, what they took away from it that I had expected because I had been thinking about it for so long was sort of an opportunity to be creative, an opportunity to tell a story together, to collaborate, to work through the conflict of I like my lyric better than yours, to build consensus, to decide something together, and then to have it all sort of come together in this beautiful finished product. Thanks to our team. It was, uh, it was just amazing and just a real, what a great takeaway, what a great asset for them to, to take. And uh, many of them have shared it with their teams and it's been, mm. been super fun. Thank you for sharing that. And what comes to my mind, and this brings us full circle to the beginning, is if we can make music together, we can live together, we can work oh, together. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, I love it. You're absolutely right. Because That's I so think good. already the to sing together is extremely bonding somehow. Something I, I don't know the the reasons or what's happening on the biological, physiological level. But then, yeah, engaging in making music together is also the the cultural difference. When you say um, there were team members from the Middle East and from Europe, so you have a different type of music that you relate to as part of your culture. So how can you fit in together to either create something new or to have a right balance? Yeah, you're helping me understand uh, more of the impact that we've brought with this. And yeah, you're right. I mean, the things that we do, and we also work with a great comedian as well, which would be another conversation for another time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but we, you know, we're putting together, uh, he and I were in Edinburgh last week designing a session that we're going to do around authentic storytelling. Oh. And so we do stuff, you know, taking his skill set of 25 years in, in a stand up comedy role. And bringing that to um, to teams and to groups is really important as well because comedy and humor, I think, is universal. Not you necessarily can laugh together. You can laugh together. You can work <laughs> together. Oh my goodness! You're going to see this all over our website. I'll give you credit, though. I'll give you credit. And peace players, most importantly. But yeah, so we, the comedy, the music, the sport, these sort of creative opportunities to you know work together. I think they do. I think they're different. I think it's interesting. I think. It's a fun way of getting to the same end point as reading a textbook on effective management, right? Let's let's make the experience more enjoyable, more sticky, because it, it turns out as well. I don't. Adam, our designer, reminds me of a story. Uh, he did a master class on memory, and in this exercise, essentially, the more silly the thing, the more memorable it is. And he basically, my my colleague Adam, can recite. The periodic table because of a story that brings in all the elements mm. of the periodic table. And so again, if we can create these experiences with comedy and music and just, you know, trying to be a bit more original and playful, I think it's going to have a better impact in the work that we're doing. Yes, I can totally see that. And I think the fact that you bring in professionals in these areas, similar to what, how I saw your work about bringing in your experience as a basketball coach suddenly it's it's coming from a professional angle it's not gimmicky it's not just a game it's not oh let's do some stand-up comedy let's uh stand on a stage and tell each other jokes no what is what is the professional skill of stand-up comedy what is the mindset of a stand-up comedian oh my goodness what can we learn from them absolutely <laughs> that's humility absolutely. pure <laughs> that's humility oh. that's vulnerability It is confronting your audience with the truth, unfiltered truth, which Absolutely. makes them laugh. Yeah. Absolutely. And the work that we've done with our comedian, his name's Jared Christmas, which is his real name, I promise. He's a, <laughs> he's a Kiwi living in England. But yeah, the work that we've done with him, actually, to your point, is all about vulnerability and creating greater psychological safety through mm -hmm. telling personal anecdotes where you're not 
you know, where you're failing and you're getting it wrong. And this is all about being humble. Nobody wants to hear a story about when Miriam was amazing in front of a thousand people and how great you were and you're in your, in your keynote, nobody cares. And so what we're trying to do is help these leaders in teams take a step in the right direction of being humble and, and sharing failures, but in a funny way, little personal, amusing anecdotes, short stories where their team can see them as human and they can see that they make mistakes and it, cre- it just changes the culture. Which now gives me a beautiful answer to an earlier question. How do you help or how do you work with these highly successful, high achieving teams and to put them into a challenging situation that is still challenging despite their huge egos and their success? Yeah, <laughs> ask them to do some stand up comedy. Here we go. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That'll be very humbling as an experience, but we do it in a very safe way and we set them up obviously as as I know you do when you're working with groups. The last thing you want to do is is bring them too far down. <laughs> yeah, and that's the high art of facilitation, right? To know what challenge keeps them in the growth zone and doesn't make them run away or fire you. Absolutely. Can can chat GPT do that? I don't think so. Not yet anyway. Not yet. Uh, I will send the script over and then let learn. <laughs> one question that I also always ask, what remains your number one facilitation challenge? My personal challenge, mm-hmm. and this is me being vulnerable because I am nervous about sharing it because anyone that's worked with me knows that I, I fall into this trap is trying to do too much. Mm. You know, and I mention it funny, it's full circle because I mentioned it at the start that that is something I've learned from trying to coach basketball is you know, you got to be really focused on and understand what you need to emphasize in a particular session and what you're trying to achieve. And I think when I'm facilitating, it's the same, it's the same sort of focus, right? I need to get, be really clear on what is a scope creep, what's taking us away from the objective and the goal, what's helping us get there and not trying to do too much. Be prepared to have a couple of things as we should as facilitators that can bring us back on track if something's not working for sure. But oftentimes I'm trying to do too much. And that comes from a place. I know where that comes from for me, Miriam. Wonder if you can relate. You know, it comes from a place of wanting to be generous and want to be accommodating mm. and wanting to give as much as possible. But I still, even after all these years, struggle with that. So I try, I'm trying to get better at it. Thankfully, I have a good team around me who know that this is an area for improvement for me that they ask me good open questions. David will often say to me, I, on how much time do you think that will take? And I'll say, oh, that'll take 10 minutes. Will it take 10 minutes? <laughs> no, it'll take 25. So let's not try and do too much. I can relate to that. Yes, the underestimating of uh, the time it takes. And then to really, yeah, also to acknowledge that it might take time to go deeper and not just to swim on the surface. Yeah, that's right. And so I guess the tip there for me is always, well, one is I think having somebody to talk out your plan with is really good, right? Mm-hmm. An experienced facilitator or somebody that can ask good questions, even even a coach is useful, right? And then, yes, I think to your point, just remaining fluid and, and flexible, you know, having a couple of things that you can bring out if you need to, but you're kind of reminding yourself before the session, I don't have to bring those out if I don't need to. Such a good point. Thank you so much, Tony, for this intriguing conversation. Oh, thank you, Miriam. It's just such a pleasure to be on this podcast because I I so admire what you do and the value you're bringing to facilitators around the world. And, you know, hats off to you. It's a real honor and long may your work continue in helping us all become better facilitators. Thank you so much. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening until the very end. I hope that you found the inspiration and the wisdom that you are looking for. And I hope that you will subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of the interviews with another inspiring facilitator from across the world. I'm devoted to continue this podcast and to deliver weekly an episode that maintains the quality that you expect and you deserve. And if you would like to help me to maintain this quality and to keep the podcast free, please help us visit workshops.work slash support to make a small donation to keep the podcast free. Thank you so much. I hope to be in your ears next week.